Hello everyone, this is Dominic from Tone Base, and I'm so excited today to have Dr. Kathleen Riley uh, in the virtual studio joining us today. Um, Dr. Kathleen Riley uh, is a musician, researcher, certified biofeedback trainer, teacher, and coach with over 45 years of experience teaching, writing, and performing. Her innovative teaching and research with performing artists enables them to tune the instrument of themselves and rediscovering the transformative power of intention expressed through spoken word, music, and movement. Uh, so she's spent years and years trying to help all of us uh, maximize our potential, overcome certain uh, physical and uh, sort of emotional boundaries in our own playing. And today we'll be talking specifically about uh, her work in biofeedback uh, with musicians and particularly with pianists in, 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 in this case. And I, I just want to quickly mention that if you have any questions, feel free to write them in the chat and I'll be able to get to them uh, toward the end of the stream. And uh, I just also want to plug that we're very excited about a biofeedback tone-based session happening in San Francisco in June, on June 11th. And I'll be actually sending out a sign-up form uh, to the entire community to so sign up if you want to potentially participate uh, in this uh, inaugural event uh, on uh, for Tone Base. So uh, with, without further ado, I'm going to bring Kathleen onto the screen. So uh, hello, Kathleen. Welcome. It's so, so kind of you to join us today. And we're very excited to hear about this. I mean, such an impressive amount of work. I'll be dropping your website in the chat. Don't worry, so people can check you out oh, more. But, uh, but, 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 you know, welcome. And I thought we could kick things off perhaps by maybe going back to the beginning. I mean, you yourself, you know, play the piano. I mean, you, you, you're a musician, but you got so involved in, uh, you know, science and, and in heart math and in all these different aspects of, of biofeedback and, and helping people, you know, uh, overcome. And I'm wondering about that, your journey to get to this point, because it seems oh. like an incredibly storied career at this point. Yes, I would love to share some of that. I began playing piano when I was four years old. We had a spinet in our home. My mother played and I remember going up to the piano and just touching the keys, being enthralled with this sound. It was as if, the, you know, it just enveloped me. And seeing this, my mother and my aunt, who used to come over on the weekends, just began to, to show me things about the piano. So they began teaching me. And one of the fondest memories I have of that time was that it was done with love. It was just loving. And so I learned to read and play and memorize little pieces before I actually started formal training at the age of seven. And then I, I quickly progressed and decided to attend Manhattan School of Music where I received my bachelor's and master's in piano performance. And I began teaching at age 19. I remember driving in and out of New York City from where I lived in New Jersey um, and I would stop off at different houses on the way and teach students. And I just loved helping other students begin to learn this. And I performed for many years in the New York metropolitan area and abroad, uh, many solo recitals, chamber music. I performed to concerti with orchestra. And in 1990, I, I, was, I felt called to go back and study more about wanting to help students understand nuance in performance, in sound. I don't know if, if any of the other people listening re can relate to this, but I remember in the mid to late 1980s with the students I was teaching, noticing a difference in something. Something was different about the way they were listening as they were playing. And this was around the time where we began to have more visual things taking our attention um, with one student who had been doing so beautifully, played classical music with, with such a heart. I asked him one day, I said, what are you listening to in addition? What are, what are your, your, you know, he says, well, I'm listening to a lot of rap and, and hip hop or whatever it was. And I said, well, okay but let's find the rhythm. Let's find the melodic flow within the rhythm. But I began to realize that the ears were not as finely tuned as they had been because they were also now more visually 
distracted by things. So they were looking. And then, of course, we had the age of cell phones come in. And, oh, goodness gracious. And so sounds began to become background in a way, except for the ping or the ding that would be a signal for you to then go and visually look at something. So I said, okay, I'm going to do a, a deeper dive into nuance. So I explored many programs. I looked at some music education programs and piano pedagogy, but I they wanted me to imitate or use methods that were already there. And I said, no, 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 I don't want to do this. So I chose a degree in piano performance, a PhD at New York University, because it gave me a wide range of courses I could look at and what I could do. And I came upon this study that I did of three concert pianists performing the same Chopin Nocturne, and they all recorded on a Yamaha disc clavier piano for me. So I was able to take all the MIDI information from the piano and analyze it. And one day I sat in Yamaha Artist Studios in New York City with my little laptop, my MIDI in and out cables and playing these performances over and over. And on the screen I had pulled up, I was using Logic Pro software and I pulled up the piano roll notation of the note bars. And as I watched, I saw in, in time and I heard the music playing, I saw the sound bars going across the screen. They were in different colors that reflected dynamics. They were not quantized, quanti they weren't in quantized form. So they were long when there was a, you know, there was a longer note and you could see a rubato, you could see, you know, a cellarando, you could see the diminuendo. And I went, oh my gosh, here's the performance score. Here is what Carl Seashore talked about with his Iowa piano camera in the 1930s. And I drove home from New York that day and I wrote almost an entire chapter by hand of my dissertation. And that was the aha moment that began to change the trajectory of my life. I didn't know it then, but one of the pianists who performed for me was my one of my dearest friends, Garrick Olson. And we have remained close friends since that time in the 1990s. And it was just such a joy to watch students who participated with me in these studies as they would hear different nuances in the performances, which by the way, they didn't hear when they just listened alone. They weren't catching it all. When they listened and saw in one student's um, words, she said, I have a picture, perfect image of the sound in time. And it was instant. They understood it. So, okay, fast forward. I get my doctorate. And then postdoctorally, one of my professors who was on my um, panel was from the School of Neuroscience in the School of Art and Science at NYU. And he was also a musician and composer. And he said, you know, you might want to come with me. I'm going down to Alabama and Birmingham, and we're looking at a study with two pianists with focal hand dystonia. It was to be a grant from the NIH. And, you know, maybe you could take MIDI measurements on your keyboard and track improvement. I said, oh, my gosh, that would be great. Well, study didn't get funded. But what I observed was profound for me because I sat and I just watched and they were putting a brace on the hands and having them do certain movements and these two people, one of them had dystonia for 10 years and after an hour and a half of these exercises, they could play. But I was also observing from my seated position, the postures the body was in, the compensations the body was making, the hands were making. And I said to myself, that will not sustain unless we change the muscle activity unless we change what is happening in the whole mechanism of the output of that. And I, I was not coming from a science background. I just, I just got this. I said, that's not going to fly. So when I came back to New York with my professor, I said this to him. 
And from that point, I enrolled in a few courses in the School of Art and Science to learn a little bit more about physiology and the brain and psychology so that I could begin to pull these pieces together. They got all excited, said, oh, are you going to get a master's? I said, oh, no, 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 no. I've had <laughs> a lot of schooling here and I've spent a lot uh, on my PhD here. So no, I'm just going to take a few courses. But that led me into the world of biofeedback as a window inside the body to begin to teach and show people what was actually happening. And it is a joy to use. And it is indeed a window. And it is the window to, to observe when something may be activated that's a little bit out of the line of firing. It may cause an injury. It may cause something that will eventually become very painful or troublesome. And ways that as you begin to learn how to embody certain ways of moving, breathing, and being, these things can, can change. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I mean, th th that's an incredible story. And I, I really appreciate you sharing that with us. I mean, it sounds like, again, over these, uh, you know, again, 45 years, you say, of, of, um, of, of working in this, in this field, uh, you've probably had just so many experiences, whether it's with Garrick Olson or, or other artists. And I, I was wondering if maybe you can share a little bit about, you know, these experiences of, of, of how, how artists kind of reacted, because I, I can imagine, I mean, perhaps, you know, even 20 years ago, some artists might have been more suspicious of all this technology, or I, I don't know, um, uh, unsure of, of, of what, you know, what biofeedback actually could tell us. But, um, you know, it, it sounds, and as we've talked in the past, it sounds like there's, you know, really tangible visual results you see and tangible results you can feel and then hear and you're playing. So do you mind maybe sharing a, a few episodes or stories about various artists that you've worked with and maybe some of the experiences they've had and perhaps any doubters you've changed to become, you know, very <laughs> much, uh, you know, uh, believing in, in, in the success of, of, the, of your kind sure. of Sure. I, I can think one, one of my other dear friends comes to mind immediately and you know him as well. And that's Frederick Chu. Hmm. And Frederick and I spent a day and Yamaha artists also um, years ago and I hooked him up. And he was playing the Prokofiev Toccata. And so he was watching, you know, I had the screen on the, on the piano and he was watching himself in real time and I was recording it and then I played it back. And as he was listening, he was watching this piano roll and he said, and, I mean, in the muscle activity, he says, that's really interesting because four measures before that octave passage began in the left hand, my muscles in this left forearm and shoulder tightened. They, the muscle activity went way up. And he says, I know why. And I never thought about it before. But I am not as comfortable with that passage and I am worried about it. So he said, okay, let me, let me take a moment. Let me breathe. Let me set an intention. Let me regroup here. And then he played it again. And it was totally different. And he said, oh, wow, yes, I could feel that. And I was more present with it instead of worrying about it. Which brings me to another question for our audience. And that is, where do you think tension begins? Where does it begin? It's a great question. Begin, what do you think? Oh, I, I mean, uh, I, I think for me, and I think for a lot of people, perhaps, you know, it begins, uh, you know, even in the mind, right? You start thinking about something, and then it starts maybe infiltrating into your heartbeat, getting faster as you get worried, and then, you know, <laughs> all hell can break it can loose. Have, <laughs> it's both and, right? So, so if I have like Frederick that. Worrying thought that, uh-oh, here it comes, okay? You're going to have an automatic response of an emergency break that goes on somewhere in the body, all right? For most of us, it could be the wrist, it could be the elbow, it could be the shoulder, you know, for some people, depending on the instrument, it's the mid-back. It doesn't matter. 
but that will constrict. Okay, pianists, you are, we are the notorious non-breathers of the musical community. What do we do before that octave passage comes? <laughs> And we play, right? Okay, well, that is constricting everything that is necessary in the body for flow, okay? It's going to constrict all the air channels that have to be going through your muscles, <laughs> through, your, through your body for things to operate. It's going to, the minute you constrict that, it's going to constrict your muscles and it's going to affect the heart rate. Okay, so the heart is your signal that goes up to your brain. So now you are in this interaction between the uh-oh and the physical emergency break. Now, I'm going to reverse that. Let's just say you practiced this one passage a lot yesterday. And maybe this morning you've, you've got a little extra soreness in that left or right hand or arm. Mm, think about it. There's an immediate accompanying, uh-oh, uh-oh, hmm, am I going to be okay? Is this going to be okay? Right. Or you may be like some of my many students I've taught at <laughs> the conservatories um, who will notice it and say, oh, well, I still have to practice that five hours today, and then they'll go over it, which will just make it worse and worse. So the mind and body are intimately connected when we are addressing tension and anxiety. These are two things that we are addressing, but we must take both areas and look, well, what is the commonality? What's the common area? What, what brings those two together? You said it earlier, Dominic. What, what is it? Where does that, what's the driver? of the emotions, it's the heart, right? So my heart, so now I'm gonna go into my little heart math speech over here. So I learned this in physiology courses at NYU and, and even more when I got certified with the Heart Math Institute, that the heart, number one, it sends more signals to the brain than the brain sends down, it doesn't do that. But, and the, Thoughts and attitudes and feelings you have are the drivers of your heart rate signal. Think about it. When you're worried, you ever notice your heart rate gets a little, you, you can feel it go up, you know? When you're feeling loving and calm and relaxed, ah, you know, there's a relaxation. And the heart rate is doing this beautiful signal of speeding up and slowing down. That's coherent. Heart rates vary, they're supposed to, but if they're like this beautiful sine wave going up and down, that's coherence. That's this beautifully harmonized balance of gas and brake pedal in your body. When we're going on all, all forces of adrenaline, well, that's kind of like driving the car down the highway at 200 miles an hour and your brake pedal isn't always so good, you know? And that is the kind of thing that can get us into a stress overload, right? So back to my heart. Okay, now when I'm calm and I've got those beautiful signals and these all, either one, the chaos signals, the incoherent ones or the coherent ones are going upward to the brain into brain centers, hmm. one of which is your sweet spot. It is our magic spot, and that is the thalamus. For the thalamus is your sensory input and output center of the brain. We receive signals from our eyes, our ears, our nose, our mouth when we taste food or, you know, we're drinking something wonderful or something tastes sour, we have a signal that goes up. We get signals from our senses, our touching, feeling things as well. When we're walking on a hard surface or we're walking up a hill and there's ditches in there and we've got to balance ourselves, their signals are constant. But the output signals are being generated 
Hmm. Output is being generated by the messages that are coming up from the heart. Oh, okay, so if I'm sending up, I'll go into the, the loving ones first. Let's say we're in that beautiful, relaxed, and as a performer, say that you're really excited to share this beautiful piece with someone because it means so much to you. Doesn't matter how many notes are there. It could be the simplest piece. Because remember, people are never counting the amount of notes you're playing. They're hearing the message that comes through. And if that is the signal, this, okay. It travels first to what we call the inner ear. Scientists and researchers call it the third, the third ear. Okay. It's a place where in that higher brain center, we actually hear a frequency of what we're going to say or what we're going to play before it's actually sounded. Okay. We already have the intent of what it is from that inner ear that travels down the super highway and out your fingertips to the instrument. Athletes refer to this as a flow state. It's flow. There's nobody in the front thinking brain going, oh, I got to put my hand in this position. Oh, I got to do this. No, it's just the body knows what to do. Trust your body. That's flow state. Now, if my signal's going up from the heart, or fear and worry, the uh-ohs, the breath is already constricted. Already that's putting a little bit of detour going into the channel, going up to the brain. It's got a wobble to it. And that signal into that inner ear is saying, okay, worry, 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 here we go. That signal is gonna have a different outcome at this end. That's the simple way to kind of say it. <laughs> As we as we refer to it, but but there is a huge effect on your intention, where you come from. Is Arthur Rubinstein uh, said in one of his many writings that if he was not in love, he had to be in love, in love, of course, with his music, which he always was but he had to feel in love with his audience. The magic key is love. I had the beautiful experience of getting to watch him live do a masterclass at Manhattan School of Music. It was a magical day. The masterclass in the morning was Jean-Pierre Rampal and the afternoon was Arthur Rubinstein. And he sat on the stage Listen to people play. Such a look of joy on his face. Gave wonderful loving comments. And when he spoke, he was such a kind man. But he spoke about love. He spoke about the joy of playing. The joy of making music. And we all know he was the champion of wrong notes. You know, And when he would play, those Back in the day, those concerts at Carnegie Hall, and yeah, some of the octaves were wrong at the end of the Chopin Ballade. Nobody cared. They leapt to their feet and shouted bravo because the music, that intention from the heart carried through and passed any note that wasn't perfect. Perfection is overrated at times. I think that's a very, very compelling statement to make that perfection is overrated because I, that's probably one of the more strong mental blocks that a lot of people have, especially yeah. students that I talk with, tone base members and more. You know, again, we have very popular community concerts happening almost almost monthly at this point. And uh, we, we all come together and Zoom and play for each other. And, and yeah, that, that's, that's always something on people's mind. And I think that the more playing in you know public they do, the more they realize, yeah, that the audience isn't looking for perfection, you know? Um, so, so I, yeah. And Rubenstein is a champion of that. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's great to, for him probably to know that 
Uh, he would get those bravos. He he didn't, ha you know, some pianists uh, were known for being perfect or whatever. And that's almost like a curse, you know, to be known for something that's not human, really. Uh, but Rubenstein was known for the, you know, the exact opposite, being the most human pianist. So I I, I think a lot of us know which, which type of pianist we'd probably rather be. And certainly if you look at his life, Rubenstein seemed to have, have a, a pretty good time, you know, uh, with, with everything that he was doing, a long, cherished life. Um, but, yes. but, 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 so that, I mean, that's amazing to hear, you know, the, these stories about these musicians and, and more. And I think, I think, you know, what, what I'm wondering about is, is now maybe getting a little bit more detailed with, um, like, for example, this upcoming session that we're doing on, on June 11th, um, you know, the, at the San Francisco Conservatory. So, you know, what, 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 what could someone expect from this experience? You know, um, again, just to give everyone a, a clear idea, we'd be having a handful of, of individuals. Uh, Garrick Olson would also be there. Uh, he'll be participating. So we're very excited about that. But, yeah, but also we're yeah. having a, a wide range of, of, of levels, actually. So, yeah, w what could someone expect if they signed up and they walked in and they said, you know, I'm here, uh, do with me what you will, you know, with uh, the biofeedback uh, equipment. Sure. So, so what, what kind of experience would that look like? Well, biofeedback will be a part of what we do together. And of course, anyone who would participate, I would invite to come in a day or two early so that we could meet the day before. And we will have a room at, at the conservatory that we'll be able to use. And where I would be able to be with you for about an hour and a half or so and you know share talk have you play have you get hooked up with what we would use and experience it so that you're not going in cold when we go into the day of, of recording and you know i would invite anyone to just bring you know something that um they they want to improve or they want to say well gee how could i how could i make this passage more effortless or how could I could I feel more at ease here? Or if you are if you are a person who experiences performance anxiety, you know what are some of the steps we can take? And in that case, I would be also sharing with you the um, biofeedback to, tools through the HeartMath Institute, where we put a little sensor on your ear, and we are measuring pulse, which will show us your heart rate variability. And just to do an example, you know, have you sit there and think about something you love. Think about something you love. It could be your children. It could be your pet. It could be cooking. It could be anything that you love. Um, and watch what the heart rate does. And then think about something you're worried about. Think about something that upsets you. And that heart rate will change. So the invitation is the come from, again, of what are we bringing in? And I'll go back to that because there's a story I'd like to share about that. But in terms of the muscle, I normally hook up um, little electrodes. They're like the kind you use when you go for an EKG, the little pads they put on your chest. And we put two at the top of each shoulder, which is your trapezius muscle, because I want to measure, I want to see what your shoulders are doing. And there are key things we will learn about certain muscles that we tend to not use that are the powerhouse muscles that actually will alleviate any shoulder tension and any excess overuse of those. We also put these electrodes on our forearm. So we're going to place them on the uh, a, a, um, muscle along the forearm so that we are monitoring our forearm use. When we have our hands in a proper alignment and our fingers being mostly controlled by the small muscle groups that are inside the hand itself that wrap around your large knuckles, these are your powerhouse muscles. And this is your powerhouse muscle for your pinky. These muscles assist, but they don't have to work so hard. Think about where most of the overuse and misuse injuries occur for pianists. Here. Okay. Wrist, forearm, elbow. So 
doing this for years. You know, I had a biofeedback lab when I taught at the Cleveland Institute of Music. I taught a course called Optimal Piano Performance, Optimal Performance. And the students who were in my course worked in the lab on themselves with both heart math and proforma vision. And at the end of each semester, there wasn't a test. They were to take screenshots of what they had done and write a reflection paper on their progress. Progress was astounding, astounding in one semester because they had a chance to see it, work with it, and most importantly, embody it. Embodiment is the key, you know, to be able to take something and say, oh yes, I know now. We don't need to be hooked up to biofeedback. It's a window when we're not conscious of it, but to know what feels right and to know when something like a thought may be coming in that's derailing us, you know, um, but going back to the intention piece in that same course, I would always ask uh, my students when we talked about this piece, what was it that brought you to learn this piece? What was the first feeling you had about it? And most often students would say to me something about, oh, I really liked it or I really, I loved it. Or I loved so-and-so's performance of it. There was just something special about it. It's beautiful. Now I want you to think of that as a seed you're planting in the garden of your heart. And with seeds, we must nurture seeds. So I'm going to ask you three questions about that seed. Did you take it with you and nurture it in the practice room when you began to work on the piece? And the students would look at me and be quiet. Secondly, did you bring that piece with you into the room when you had your next lesson with your teacher? And their eyes would lower often. Lastly, and most importantly, did you bring it onto the stage with you when you performed? And in one class, Monday, one young lady said so quickly, no. I can tell you what happened. And it was pretty fast. That feeling of love, excitement, curiosity changed into feelings of worry and anxiety about getting the right notes. She was a violinist, so she's playing in tune, the right fingerings and not making mistakes. And every student in that class nodded their heads. It was profound. It was a memory that etched in my brain and made this an even more important mission for me to bring people back to their hearts. Yeah. I mean, it's very powerful to think about that because I, I think all of us can ask that question, you know, uh, right now you know whether we're watching this live or we're watching this you know in an archival recording uh, about those those three comments um uh, because i i think if we're honest with ourselves i think most of us um probably maybe maybe we have that in the practice room but it's it's hard to take that when there's eyes on you and and, and you start feeling yeah uh more vulnerable more more nervous more scared and, and more so i mean uh so so again it sounds like um, you know, again, this is a very personal and very thorough process and analysis, really, uh, and experience for any individual that uh, works with you. Uh, and, and particularly in, in June, you know, th this would again basically deal with, you know, maybe a day before a consultation yeah. and, the, and, then the, and then the day of. Um, right. And the day before, yeah. I will, I mean, you will be doing it in the masterclass as, as a review for everyone who's going to then see the masterclass. I will be teaching specific grounding techniques, specific breath work that I bring in from uh, Dr. Sue Mortar and the HeartMath Institute as well, um, because these are very, very important grounding techniques. And there are breath break breathing techniques. So one will be a central channel breathing. The other one, the most important one is a heart coherence breath. 
so that this breath is what you bring and you exude out into the room as you're walking onto a stage. I did this in a pilot study with a string quartet in 2018. And it was, it was a study to look at the effects of a shared heart intention upon members of the quartet and audience members. And when they did this piece where I guided them in this breathing and feeling the intention and intent, embrace our instruments. There has to be a feeling of oneness with the instrument. And how many times do people and students and musicians feel a struggle with something that doesn't feel quite right. Uh, no two people's bodies are the same. So no technique is going to fit exactly one way for everyone. But in this relationship building with the instrument, we begin to understand how to weave together. This is an essential piece. And this is something I will bring in in the masterclass and the heart coherence breath, you are extending outward so that when you start to breathe a feeling of love or just a feeling of care, you care. You care about your music. You care about the piano. You care. It's pretty hard at that same time to feel a feeling of fear. Those two don't coexist in, in, at the same time. So it, it's, it's a matter of bringing the mind home onto the heart, calling the mind back home onto your heart. Call the mind, that thinking mind that wants to go on the runaway train through the brain and take you into the what ifs. <gasps> what if I miss that note? <gasps> what if I have that memory slip? <gasps> what? Okay. You know, let's not go there. So anyway, that's that's the breathing part. Muscle, oh, you'll get it immediately. There's a, there are some simple moves I'll show you in the hand, in the in the arm. I'm not going to give it away now, but I'll teach you this magical muscle in your arm, and you'll be like, oh my god, how come I never knew about that muscle? Because we didn't have classes in anatomy and physiology when we were learning piano, right? But that's why that brings me to another point. I'm doing the book I'm doing. So I'm actually uh, creating a book that should be ready for everyone when um, when our master classes aired live or you know aired on tone base. And it is about the um, embodiment, like how how we we actually have to have our position, how we breathe, how we do all this. And I'm working with a phenomenal friend who is a medical illustrator, Bill Scavone. And I found Bill back in 2007, or I can't remember, when I was beginning to use drawings of muscles in some of my lectures and my PowerPoints that I was doing for master classes and presentations at conferences. And uh, so he is beginning to, to make these things come alive for me in a different way. I showed one to Dominic this morning, and I'm super, super excited about bringing this forward because... The pictures speak a thousand words and make it easier to understand. You don't have to know a whole lot about science, but you do have to know about your body and what's what's driving what, how we put the pieces together. But the day together, our days together in San Francisco will be full of fun and 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 experimenting, you know, kind of bring your curiosity is all I can say. Absolutely. I mean, it's very exciting. Again, the the illustrations uh, that 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 you're working with, uh, the one I saw today, which everyone will see, you know, later this 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 year, uh, are, are really in, you know interesting stuff. You know, to really see what's what's happening at the body. And and this might be a, a silly question, but with biofeedback, do you see both sides of the equation? Do, do you see you know the negatives, the things that you can work on? But do you also see like things that are working well? Like, will biofeedback oh, certainly? Yes, yes. Thank you for bringing that in. <laughs> So I can tell many stories to you of um, 
students and even professionals who would come and and um I've done days of just demos. I did one for the San Francisco Symphony, a couple of them last year, where you know, members would come in and get hooked up, you know, 20 or 30 minutes each with me. And I could show, wow, that is just perfect. Yeah, look at you. Okay, now, what if we adjust your posture just a little bit this way? What if you drop your elbow a little bit so your elbow is not up, but you but it feels like it's on a pillow of air and boom, the muscles would go even lower. But what they started with was an excellent form. There was a young man who was a saxophone player years ago when I did a big uh, training for this Crane School of Music. And he came in and he said, oh no, it was actually, it was, um, was that where I was? I don't remember, but, but the story was that he came in and he was complaining of neck ache. And he was tall, he was well built, he put the strap on, he held the instrument, he took a breath in, he began to play and all the muscles were down just doing hardly anything. And he looked at the screen, he said, this isn't working. I said, yes, it is. He looked at me, I said, okay, tighten your shoulders, go like this. He did, the lines went up. I said, okay, take a hand, squeeze it, yeah, do this. He did, lines went up. She said, well, I don't understand. He said, okay, I will tell you what I see. You are doing everything technically perfectly, but your neck strap looks like it's pulling on your neck. I suggest you investigate a harness for your instrument. He left with the biggest smile. He said, I can't thank you enough. I was just ready to start reworking my technique. <gasps> Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so, so I, I mean, that, that's uh, pretty compelling uh, because, again, uh, what you're doing right, some people can sometimes mess that up when they try to overcompensate without some of this education and, yeah. and, and insight. So, yeah. that's and when I do biofeedback with the performer vision, so you're, two, you're seeing two screens or two cameras, like we're looking at each other here, and above it is the windows of muscle activity. I'm gonna. I'm placing cameras around your body from angles you can't possibly see mm. when you're playing. And one young man who had come to me because of some injury had sent me an audition tape. And so the second session I sent, I spent with him. I said, "Well, we're going to, we're going to analyze your audition tape, but not in the way you think we're going to analyze it." I'm going to turn the sound off and I'm going to move the cursor and I'm going to stop it at certain areas. And I want you to look at your body posture. And I began to teach. He was all hunched over and he had his, his, you know, left leg up and it wasn't even on the ground. And he had this and he had a collapsed hand and so forth. And he went, Oh my God. Uh, how come I never knew this? I said, because your teacher didn't bring your awareness to it, number one, but you weren't looking at it. By the time we got through into the middle of the second piece, he was seeing everything himself. It was a revelation that was so profound that there was almost an instant transformation. And that was without even hooking him up. But when we don't see ourselves in that way, how can we make changes? We can't. Yeah. Right. That makes perfect sense. And I, I, I know that, uh, um, again, you know, part of the reason that, <clears throat> you know, we'll be at San Francisco Conservatory is because, again, you know, uh, students, conservatory students, you've, you've worked with uh, all, all kinds of very talented, you know, pre-professional uh, musicians. Yes. Uh, so, so so this is something that, that happens at every stage of a person's development, whether they're right. amateurs, uh, professional, beginner, intermediate, advanced um, and, and yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the the question that I wanted to follow up with is um, so uh, you know just to again keep it keep it open um, is is this is this biofeedback for for anyone I, I mean is this for you oh. know uh, all kinds of different ailments whether it's arthritis let's, or carpal tunnel yes. or, or any uh, 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 let's talk about that so okay. so I will be having a college student a conservatory student join us um, 
from the San Francisco Conservatory. And of course, Garrick will join us, join me at the end. Um, but in between, I would like to have two people and, you know, this can be at any level. Um, I invite seniors for sure. I invite anyone who may be having some arthritis or some sort of constriction in the body. There are ways that we can begin to, to adapt and to move around that. Okay, so yes, please, please, please. I mean, I'm I, I became a genius at refingering with so many of the clients I worked with at the Cleveland Institute of Music Cleveland Clinic. I was on staff there for over a year. So I saw musicians and non-musicians. But I had one pianist who was a, a high-level amateur, but she was a doctor in the clinic. And she came to me weekly. And often I was just refingering passages for her so that she could work them more efficiently and the muscle tension go, would go down. Um, I invite anybody who is a professional and, and is experiencing any, anything, or if you're a high, if you're an amateur, you're a high level amateur. So you went to, you got your bachelor's in piano or you're, you know, and then you're doing something else. It doesn't matter because we all play and we all, we all matter. And there was something else I, I've been meaning to say about music and it is some of the latest research and findings through science and there is a huge initiative with national endowment for the arts and the national institute of health on renee fleming is spearheading it and that is music as medicine and her newest book which she has brought together edited is music and mind it is groundbreaking we all are healers through sound. The book that I am writing with the working title of Harmonic Resonance, Tuning the Instrument of Self is just about that. Using music as a metaphor, but for everyone, that our intent affects the tonality of our voice. It affects everything we talked about earlier about the way it comes through music. And through all indigenous cultures from the beginning of time, music has been healed to, uh, has been used to heal, to bring communities together. It is a common language. If we look at the work of Yo-Yo Ma and what he's doing with his latest projects for humanity, this is a purpose that we are all here for. And we all have a seat at this kind of table of sound and music. It matters. When you bring that thread into your heart, it's pretty hard to get all fretted up about being perfect. When we can play for populations that are in such need. I'm also thrilled to share that I have been working with the US military musicians for almost two years. I've been on a special team at Walter Reed and I was with one of our army bands in Hawaii last summer and I just received my contract award. I will be in Washington, D.C. in the fall, working with our U.S. Air Force musicians. I am bringing HeartMap. They're buying the sensors. They're, they're already excited about it and some of these latest, latest techniques to them. Um, and of course, their, their mission is to be sharing music around the world as messengers of healing and hope. I mean, that's, that's beautiful, and congratulations on, on this new exciting endeavor. Um, much needed, indeed. So, I, I, mean, I mean, this is all, you know, really inspiring stuff uh, to, to, be, to be hearing about, and I, I, I hope that certainly the anticipation uh, for, for the Tone Base uh, session with you, uh, uh, it's, it's going to be growing over, over the weeks. So, again, I'll be sending out a sign-up uh, about this uh, tomorrow to everybody. Um, but I, but I, before we uh, signed off, uh, there there was one question that I wanted just to maybe uh, get specifically. Um, one of our one of our viewers, Michelle, was asking about: Does Kathleen have any thoughts on on like hypermobility and how to improve uh, proprioception while playing? Um, I, do you have any any thoughts on on, on these things? Is she talking the hypermobility in the hand? Um... I think so. Um, yeah, I know Michelle's a, a pianist, uh, and uh, yeah, of course, I, I know for you, you, you probably need to get as specific as possible. That's okay. Um, Just a little, but... a little framework for that, because when okay, so when we're in 
the hand. I remember one student I had years ago who was very hypermobile. And I, I do some very um, specific strengthening exercises for the intrinsic muscles. In fact, I'm pleased to share that when I was with the um, head of the hand biomechanics research lab at the Cleveland Clinic one day discussing this and our um, one of our head neurologists who headed up the musician's clinic there was also present. I was talking with this um, researcher about the way I isolate and strengthen intrinsics. And he said, show me. And it's just something simple on the tabletop. I do. And I remember when he looked at me and he says, that is the muscles. How did you figure it out? I said, I just did it because it made sense to me. And there's a way that we can work with that. So I would definitely encourage you, if you want to come to San Francisco, oh, would I love to work with you or, and, or um, contact me by email and we could have a Zoom and talk about it. I would love to. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to put my Wonderful. email in the chat. Oh, there. yes. Yes. Actually, I'm going to right now, I'm going to drop your. Yeah, put my email in the chat. Um, please contact me, Michelle. I would love to. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Let, let me. About that. Let me uh, drop your email and your website just so that Michelle can certainly get that. Yeah, and for everybody, um, because I think these yeah. there are some, there are some big pieces here. I can also send, there are links on my website, I think under media. The Oh, the, there are three short videos under media. Um, the one of which is about the intention. They were done about the story I told about those three questions I asked my students. Another is about music's role in the universe. And the third is about a, um, a performance prep technique. It's like how to set yourself mindfully and heartfully before you begin to practice. It's kind of planting a seed deeper. And those are each about two minutes. Yeah. Lovely. Thank, thank you so much. I, I'm actually just, yeah, just dropping your email as well right now. I'm just copying that over. Um, you can also, you can also put my cell phone in there. People are, you're free to text me, anybody that wants to. <laughs> Sounds I'm, good. <laughs> I actually answer my telephone, so. <laughs> Very unless good. It me, unless it tells me it's spam. Oh, of course, <laughs> of course. But, Understandable. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, listen, I, I, you know, as we get to the, the top of the hour, are there any last thoughts yeah. you'd like to leave us with? Just oh. go ahead. Oh, 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 oh sorry. I, I wasn't sure. Uh, if go ahead. I was just going to say, um, every day before you sit down to play a note, bring a sense of appreciation into your heart. Sit quietly. Don't just sit down to work on that passage again. In fact, Garrick and I talk about this often, and. He shared, you know, years ago with me that when he begins to play in the morning, he starts with a very simple piece, usually Chopin, of course, but something he dearly loves. He says, not a lot of notes, something that touches my heart. It will set the tone. For you, it sets the tone for the day. In fact, even if you're not going to the piano, I invite you every morning to set the tone for your day. Tuning the instrument of you. When the ripples come through the day, those little annoyances come in, you're stuck in traffic, remember to push pause. Push pause on the heart. That's your pause button. Take a few slower and deeper breaths and bring in a sense of gratitude for anything you can. That will change your heart rate immediately. It will clear your mind. And you'll realize what you were fretting about is really much ado about nothing. That's lovely. Well, thank you for those those final thoughts, Kathleen. It's it's been a very beautiful session today. I I know that I'm I cannot wait to um you know I'll be there in San Francisco uh, in June uh, of course of course filming the 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 whole day. Can't wait to have F. Garrick there, have one of the, the college students there, and of course uh, a handful of, of other participants. So please sign up if you are interested uh, in attending this this session. Uh, but uh, you know, stay tuned for for more information about that, and also Kathleen's book, of course, 
and and I think this is uh, really your work is a gateway into this next you know age of sustainable music making, healthy music mm-hmm. making. So uh, I'm just I'm really excited about this and, and can't wait to learn more. Uh, I think we all are eager eyed and eager eared. So thank you so much for today, um, everyone. Look for, look for a sign up coming uh, to you shortly this week, and I'll, I'll see you guys next time. So oh, thank you I so much. I look forward to hearing from you all, and I look forward to a couple of you joining me in San Francisco. I can't wait to meet you. Absolutely. Cheers, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Bye bye. <laughs>